Mr. John Zimmerman of Active Towns. He will be presenting today on creating a culture of activity, and he is the perfect person to do this. John is a veteran public health and health promotion professional with over 30 years of experience helping communities create more people-oriented places through proven all ages and abilities design concepts and evidence-based behavior change initiatives. And you can find more information about John and his work through his website, Active Towns, uh, the Active Towns podcast, and a YouTube channel devoted to Active Towns. And you can find links to all of those if you haven't had a chance to check them out. Um, in your program, there's a little QR code. You can find more information about all of our speakers there. And we've included links for John's social media and his website and everything. So with Without further ado, I will call to the stage John Zimmerman. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak with you here today. I'm, I'm really kind of coming at this world from a background in public health and disease prevention, healthcare cost containment. I spent the first 15 years of my career working with Fortune 500 companies, trying to work on creating healthy workplaces and healthy environments. Uh, and then about, I don't know, 15 years in, I, I, I needed a change. And so I sort of shifted and looked at the background in terms of, uh, you know, how our communities are designed and encouraging healthy lifestyles and, and health behavior. Uh, my formal training is actually in human physiology and exercise science and public health. Uh, but then I also was you know, integrating a whole lot of health behavior psychology and habit formation and what it takes to create uh, really a, a, a culture of activity and health and wellness. And, Part of that journey you know, gave me the opportunity over the last 34 years uh, to inspire, promote, and advocate for healthy communities and a culture of activity across the country and around the globe. And it's funny how life goes. <laughs> as Carol mentioned, uh, I'm out on YouTube and uh, to be able to say as I'm closing in on 60 years of age that after, uh, you know, at this stage in my career, I'm most widely known internationally as that active towns guy on YouTube. So funny how things go. <laughs> but my mission is really quite simple. Help communities create and maintain a culture of activity. Well, what do we mean by that? I mean, what is a culture of activity? It first occurred to me um, early in my career when I made the move from Chicago to Boulder, Colorado. Uh, anybody ever visit Boulder, Colorado? Yeah, look, look, quite a few hands. Uh, it was rather obvious as soon as I got there that there was this sense of a culture of activity there. And what I mean by that is activity permeated through all aspects of life. And it bears you know, taking some time to actually define what activity is. And, and clearly, when we think of activity, physical activity and movement, we sometimes think of you know, formal exercise, actually putting on exercise clothing and going out and doing a workout. Uh, this is out in, in downtown Detroit, Michigan, on the Greenway there, the DeKinder Cut. But it's also recreation and play and you know, getting out with your friends. Uh, this actually happens to be a trio of workers out on a midday meeting they're talking about a project that they're doing while they're out on the trails and greenways there in Boulder, Colorado. So I, I guess I should call this like serious fun, working fun. Oh, now that's an active meeting right there. And it's also active hobbies like hiking and birding and gardening. These are all f forms of physical activity as well as meditative movement having access to nature, like on the trails that you all are working on and the greenways. This is actually a, a central uh, park in Paris in the 12th arrondissement. And it's just a wonderful opportunity to get out and get some nature in. There's also this concept of active mobility, being able to get to meaningful destinations uh, so that we can go about our daily lives and integrate physical activity and low levels of moderate to you know, activity just going about our day. Like these kiddos getting to school on this particular trail in Boulder, Colorado. So 
Well, there's, there's a little bit of a challenge, right? <laughs> the 800 pound gorilla in the room is that, you know, when we speak of a culture of activity, we have this rather complicated relationship with physical movement and activity. On one hand, it's the most natural thing that we can do. We see it in kids. They just, they'll get out and they'll run. This is in Kailua, Kona, Hawaii, where I used to live. And you know, you, the, it just exudes physical activity. And so it is one of the most natural things that we can do as humans. But we have this rather complicated relationship with physical activity. Yeah. This is a, this is a classic old photo, and I, I bring this out, and, I, and, and I, I sometimes I cringe at bringing this out because it's been around for a long time. But this is in San Diego. It's in Point Loma. Uh, San Diego, as many of you probably know, has nearly perfect temperatures all year round. And so it's not like these guys are f feeling the need to do it because it's 110 degrees or anything. It's just that we have that sort of complicated relationship. Uh, how many of you arrived at the hotel here today uh, at, on, the, on the ground floor and then came up the stairs? Show of hands. Yeah, yeah. I now know how many of us are staying in the hotel and came down the elevator. <laughs> so my question for you is why? Why did you take the stairs? Yeah, they're right there. They were convenient. And guess what? The elevators were around the corner and you had to search them out and find them. And so that's a big part of what this uh, photograph is also saying. It's talking about, are we making it easy to integrate physical activity into our lives? Whereas we've sort of designed physical activity out of our lives, okay? And so that brings us around to design, community design. And that brings us around to what you all are doing within your communities, within your regions, is trying to create activity assets, both the software and the hardware, uh, that is you know, part of doing this. And we're gonna start with the software. And these are, the, these are the, a lot of the stuff that you all are working on. These are the policies, these are the plans, these are the programs that actually bring the hardware to life, okay? These are the things that are the political decisions that need to take place so that we have the funding to be able to build these things. These are the policies that are in place that make it possible to really encourage active mobility. And then there's also you know, the coalitions, the advocacy groups, and the alliances that are out there that are helping support and advocate for and call for bringing those policies, you know, those, those uh, plans and those procedures into, into fruition. So it's important that we also have that side of the house as well. We also have the formal programs, the actual government programs that are also helping to educate, engage, and you know, bring some of that activation of the hardware that we're gonna talk about in just a moment. But there's also the really cool uh, activity-oriented events that are out there too. Uh, I like to call these the signature events. I, I mentioned that I was in uh, uh, Kailua Kona, Hawaii, which is where the world championships are for the world, uh, for the Ironman distance triathlon. Uh, who here has heard of the Boston Marathon? Yeah, yeah, exactly. These are signature events. This particular event here is a really cool event that I'm gonna have to come and do one of these days is riding from New York to, the, uh, to Philadelphia as a fundraiser for the East uh, Coast uh, Greenway. Uh, these are really, really important from a normalization aspect, bringing awareness about the value of these types of programs. Okay, it's time for me to shift gears. Anybody catch the pun on that? <laughs> it's time to talk about the hardware activity assets. And these are the things in the physical realm that uh, we can go right out here in the lobby where everybody's set up and we can look at the maps and we can say over here we've got this park and over here we've got a trail, over here we've got this really nice swimming hole and pool, we'll get to that in a second. But these are the things that are out there. That's why I call them hardware and software. These are the things in the physical realm. And speaking of pools, this is my pool. So this is walking distance from my house and it's part of a greenway. So this is the Barton Springs Pool, and it is a spring-fed pool. 
from our natural aquifer. And this is where land conservation also comes in because there was an extensive amount of work put forth to in, you know, go through and conserve a fair amount of land in this watershed to keep those springs flowing. And so that's a big part of it as well. And again, I'll emphasize, this is within walking distance of, of my home, and that will come up again and again in terms of convenience and proximity to activity assets. There's also our you know, built environment, our protected and separated pathways and uh, cycle tracks. Uh, this happens to be in Delft in the Netherlands, in South Holland, and it's a canal side multi-use uh, trail and pathway. You'll see in the red bricks is uh, where the, the bikes are at and then uh, people uh, walking are in the gray uh, infrastructure there. I was having this conversation with Liz uh, yesterday on the bike ride of the Dutch really do try to keep some consistency to what the cycle tracks look like. So they like using the color red. So it's frequently the red bricks or red colored asphalt for their, their bicycle infrastructure. Helps you know, create some delineation and some separation. So bike parking is one of my favorite activity assets. Why? Because it helps you know, that other end of the journey. Think about it when we drive a car. One of, the thing, one of the reasons why we are so uh, apt to jump in our cars and drive them is we know that there's a place for us to park it when we get there, okay? And the same thing goes for the bike parking. Uh, this is about 20% of the bike parking at that pool that we just saw earlier. So again, this is about a five minute bike ride for me from my house, and this is only a small portion of the bike parking at that particular pool. It's that popular of a pool. All of those bike parking spots will actually be taken up on a busy hot day, which we've been having a lot of lately. <laughs> Comfort facilities are also incredibly important activity assets to be thinking about. Do you have restrooms? Do you have access to water um, at these facilities? And again, this is at that same area. So this is just a, a little ways down from where I lock up my bike, and this is at the trailhead to the Barton Creek Greenbelt, and this is where I do my uh, trail runs. So I'll be there multiple times during the week. Um, if I need to use the facilities, I can. They're there, they're convenient. So these, again, are the types of activity assets that help encourage and support a culture of activity. This is also an activity asset too. These are your retail establishments and your other service businesses. You may not even think about, oh yeah, that, that bike shop and that running shoe store, uh, that outdoor camping gear store. These are all incredibly important activity assets to an environment, to a community. And oftentimes they have bike rides and clubs and meetups and fun runs that exist on a weekly basis weekly basis, daily basis. The, the, notice some of the words that I'm using here. When we talk about creating a culture of activity, we're talking about establishing healthy habits and lifestyles. How many of you brush your teeth every day? At least once a day. Wait a minute. <laughs> it's four, three or four times a day. Um, yeah, th these are healthy habits. Activity is a healthy habit. Think of it this way. 10,000 years ago, what were we doing? We were incredibly active. We were mostly a hunter-gatherer society. Then after that, we decided to you know, settle down and start doing agriculture. That was pretty busy too. That was pretty active as well. So really healthy activity, activity is incredibly healthy for the body. So that's one of the things that I love about this as well, is that integration. Now, Notice what I said about these retail establishments as well, is that they sort of you know, blend the lines between being a hardware activity asset and being a software activity asset. The hardware is the physical location. We can put a pin in the map and say they're over there. But if they're doing fun runs, if they're doing things, that's an engagement activity for the community. So you've got a blending of those uh, hardware and software. Also, people-oriented streets. Um, Y'all are in the business of greenways and trails and, and pathways. Those were the precursors to streets. Think of our, how our communities were designed 
and built and evolved over time prior to the automobile, prior to horse and carriage. We walked everywhere. These were walkable communities and these were trails and pathways. Um, I have a little mantra called streets are for people. And that's because for thousands of years, streets really were for people. And it wasn't until 120 years ago where we had the interloper, the automobile, started to weasel their way in. Now, this particular city here is one of the very, was the very first city to really bring the electric streetcar into fruition. And so that was one of the precursors to the automobile sort of taking over the public environment, the public realm. Our largest public realm is in fact our streets. Okay, but we're here to talk about this. Our greenways, our trails, our pathways are the most significant activity assets that our communities have access to. And one of the reasons is it's a much more comfortable environment to be when you are separated away from those big stinky automobiles. So if you can have a pathway like this, and by the way, this is also in, um, in Austin, a, a five minute bike ride for me to get to the Butler Hike and Bike Trail, which is a 10 mile loop around Lady Bird Lake. Absolutely delightful. And one of the things that you notice right away here is it's for all ages and abilities. Very, very important. So these are some of the words that we, we use when we talk about active towns. What are active towns? What are active cities? What are active communities? What are active neighborhoods? What are active regions? What are active states? Secretary, what are active states? Yes, absolutely. These are walkable places. These are bikeable places where all ages and abilities feel comfortable getting out and riding. These are whimsical, memorable, fun places like in Pearl Street in Boulder, Colorado here. These are places that bring people out and activate. They're sociable for everyone, including our furry friends. I love this photo. <laughs> the little, little doggy there is just having a ball. And these are lovable places for young and old. Who recognizes where this is? Shout it out if you do. Shout it out. That's right, Mackinac Island. What is, what is special about Mackinac Island? No automobiles. It's one of the only place, places in North America that is completely car free. And you know what kind of a fight it was for them to, to prevent you know, them to get the cars out? It wasn't a fight at all. They banned them even before cars were invented. They had that, that it's actually been car free since the very, very beginning. Uh, interestingly enough, some of the original families that were there were part of motordom. They were part of General Motors and Ford and Chrysler. They had the wisdom to say, you know what, this, we, we want this to be a car free zone. And it is. What's interesting about this is take a look at the photo here and see, there's like a, it, it almost looks like automobile infrastructure. It's like car brain is like all through us. Now, the reason why they do that is uh, they do have horse-drawn carriages where you can ride. And so they, do, uh, they did put a, a, a little uh, stripe in the middle there so that you've got a little delineation between the two-way traffic. It is one of the most amazing environments for you to, to visit. And the thing that will resonate with you immediately, and it's something you can relate to out on your trails and greenways, is how quiet it is. It's like the motor vehicle noise just isn't there. You get there and you're like, I'm hanging out here and I can hear a conversation that's going on down, down the way there. You can hear the band that's playing on the front lawn and the front porch at one of the other places. So you start to hear people. It's really, really cool. These are lovable places. These are also livable places. The quality of life metrics that you have when you have an active town, when you have a place where there is a culture of activity, and uh, this particular location is in Vail, Colorado, where it's shared space. You know, motor vehicles are allowed there. But if you look at the design of the street, what you notice here compared to the previous photo in Mackinac Island is there's a different design element, a texture to how the street is built. They put paver stones very much like in Europe so that there's that tactile feedback to people who are driving that, oh, by the way, you're not in motor vehicles place, you know, places here, you're in people-oriented places, people-oriented streets. This is why I say streets are for people. 
Okay, what's the research say? Well, active cities, active communities, active towns are healthier, wealthier, they're safer, they're greener, they're more, more cohesive. This is a study that was done by the Active Living Research uh, Institute out of the University of California in San Diego a few years ago along with Nike as a sponsor. And it's, these are places where people want to live. Secretary mentioned it earlier. Is, you know, is, it's like these are places where our upcoming generations want to be. Our only problem is we need more of them. How do we create more activity-promoting places? How do we create a community with a strong culture of activity? Well, we have to prioritize it. We actually have to prioritize activity. We have to build it in. That's why when we started talking about software, we talked about how important it is to have those plans, have the policies put in place because what do we need? We need funding. We need resources to be able to design, build, and maintain. Yeah, maintain is one of the things that oftentimes gets forgotten in that mix. It's like we get it out there, we build it, and then it's like, oh yeah. Did anybody budget being able to handle the, the floods that happen and be able to maintain the facility on a regular basis? So it's very, very important that we have it all in there. We also have to have a sense of um, you know, creativity. Sometimes you have to integrate activity into our daily lives, like the school drop-off zone in an area. And so this is a school zone transformation that took place in Sevilla in, in Spain. And they were like, you know what? Why are we having this crush of automobiles? Yes, they do that there too, uh, to drop off kids. And so they re-transformed that environment. And you all can be part of this too, because I can guarantee you that sometimes you've got some trails, greenways, pathways that might be pretty darn close to where schools are located. Can you help encourage more kids to be able to get to school in that manner? And this is where you guys are, this is your bread and butter. How many people are involved in, in identifying uh, existing resources that, out, uh, that are out there that need to be activated? Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Okay, folks, look around and see how many people. Yeah, this is your bread and butter. No, 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 you, you don't get this one. This was in Colorado, so you have plenty of them. <laughs> I can tell from, uh, from all the great work that you all are doing that um, this is one of the really, really interesting things about the state of Pennsylvania is you have a lot, you have a plethora. In fact, you probably have too many that are out there that need to be dealt with. I mean, going back to the funding, it's, it's probably a matter of resources and funding and manpower to be able to go through the difficult process. Lynn and Nancy uh, took us on the D&H uh, trail yesterday, and we got to hear a little bit of the story from Nancy, you know, from the early days of what it took to get the D&H uh, moving. And it, it's a lot of work, and so I applaud you for, you know, what you're doing to be able to activate these potential resources, these rights of way are absolutely critical. Building bold projects, passing bold policy initiatives that last through multiple you know, political cycles you know, is incredibly important. Administrations come and go, but can you put down the policies that will outlast each of those political cycles? Can you build amazing projects like this particular bike and pedestrian bridge over Lady Bird Lake in downtown Austin, which again is about a five minute bike ride for me to get to and get across? And in addition to this being one of the coolest places for uh, uh, folks to do selfies with the backdrop of the city and, and group photos, it's also my 1.6 mile route to my grocery store. So I'll ride my cargo bike through and go pick up groceries for the week, and so this is the, the view that I get to, to pass by. Yes, you can already tell I've been rather, rather privileged. I've lived in Hawaii, I've lived in Austin, uh, I live a virtually car-free life in Austin, Texas, and I've also lived in Boulder, Colorado. Very, very fortunate to be able to say that I've been able to do that. And it, it helps with photos too, which is good. <laughs> so build it and they will come. Is it true? Well, yeah, if we get the design right. And that's a big if. We have to be able to get the design right. Then we have to 
activate it, maintain it, and continually to encourage use. So again, it's the, it's the hardware and the software working together. Incredibly important. And the de minimum design <laughs> requirement is it's got to be safe. It's got to be inviting and welcoming for all ages and abilities. Again, that's one of my mantras, all ages and abilities. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's, it has to be comfortable for multiple generations. You know, three and four generations being able to participate, walk, bike, you know, participate in that environment. That's what an all ages and abilities activity asset looks like. And I really do mean all abilities. We need to create our facilities, our bike lanes, and our pathways to really welcome folks of all ability levels. And we need to look at this from the, the standpoint of creating an activity asset that is truly an invitation. We're talking about trying to establish a culture of activity here, so it needs to be an invitation, not a dare. What's a dare? A dare is when we paint a bike lane on a road and say, okay, we're done. Are you gonna to wanna to do that, Lynn? Are you gonna to wanna to ride on that so much? Not so much. That's a dare. So we need to create authentic opportunities. These are, what we're trying to do here now is we're working on habit formation. We're working on reducing friction points. Other friction points are cost, our access, our proximity. You know, we want to address all of these things to be able to make sure that this is something that is very doable, pleasurable. There's a sense that, yeah, I can do, I can make this trip, whatever this trip may be, it might be a trip trying to get to one of your greenways uh, and pathways, and I wanna be able to do that so if we make it very convenient uh, and comfortable, then folks will actually do it. And this is a, one of my favorite photos from Boulder, Colorado, because um, one, I sometimes wish I had winter. <laughs> Once again, uh, after after spending you know a decade in Hawaii and then now a decade in in Austin, I I frequently do go back up to Boulder. But I snapped this photo uh, of this uh, um, type making his way to uh, to his elementary school. He rides every single day because he has access to a greenway and a pathway where he doesn't have to fight with motor vehicles and he's able to do that. That's what we talk about when we're, we're talking about trying to reduce some friction. We're creating environments, facilities that make it comfortable and easy for, for this you know, young man to make it to his elementary school, which is immediately behind me uh, from where I'm taking this photo. We're also trying to do what we can. I, I keep harping on that concept of all ages and abilities. And what we're talking about here when we're looking at habit formation is making it comfortable, making it convenient. And this is where cohesiveness comes in. We've heard that word earlier today. It's incredibly important. You all have an amazing number of pathways and greenways in segments and we need to get them cohesive and connected to their communities as well as to each other. And so that's a big part of it. The other thing that I love about this uh, particular photo here, which is uh, also from the Netherlands, is it really emphasizes that this is not bicycle infrastructure. These are not bike lanes. I say, wait a minute, John, what do, you, what do you mean they're not bike lanes? They're not bicycle infrastructure. These are human mobility lanes. You are seeing that this is how people with disabilities actually do get around. And part of the reason is, is the sidewalks are built with materials that are not easily traversed in a wheelchair. And so having smooth, comfortable, cohesive, and convenient facilities makes it very, very easy. So I even hesitate to call bike lanes bike lanes anymore. They're really human mobility lanes. One of the things, and these are some photos, by the way, I do have some photos uh, mixed in here from, from you all, uh, from your social media feeds. <laughs> and one of the great things about the trails and greenways and pathways is it helps us deal with one of our biggest challenges in our society, which is social isolation. We are a social species, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in the final slide, if I don't 
mention it, remind me, and I'll, I'll be sure to talk a little bit more about that. But the other thing that I love about this particular photo, um, which I think I did get from one of the Facebook pages, um, you know, from one of your programs right here in this county, is that the image really talks to design here. Frequently, cities are asking me and, and advocates are asking me about, well, how wide should our facilities be to be truly welcoming to all ages and abilities and encourage multiple generations? And I'm like, yeah, wider. <laughs> and they say, well, well, how wide's that? And I'm like, yeah, wider than that, too. The other thing that I love this about this particular trail is, uh, it is the fact that there's a natural surface uh, trail off shoulder off to the side. I mentioned earlier, I'm a trail runner. As a trail runner, I'd rather be on a natural surface. And so that takes a little bit of pressure away from the paved section to have a, a access to a natural surface as well. So that's one of the things that I love about this photo, one of many. The other thing that we need to do, and we, we, we heard this earlier and I saw it out at one of our uh, booths out front, and be sure to walk around and check out all the booths. Uh, they were celebrating the number of bridges that they were do doing and, you know, Sometimes we're literally talking about bridges and sometimes we're talking about bridging barriers uh, you know, from a metaphorical standpoint. This is an actual bridge that needed to get over a barrier and this is at uh, the, the Coulee Verte in the 12th arrondissement in Paris. And again, it creates an opportunity for all ages and abilities to participate in this linear park. And this particular linear park, the Coulee Verte, uh, is, is actually the inspiration for the High Line in, in New York City. So this is uh, one of those special, special uh, activity assets that exist. This is incredibly important for what you all are doing. This is your day, this is, this is what you guys are, are, are looking at, is bridging the gaps between your different activity assets, between your different communities. Many of them are rural communities. This particular facility happens to be in rural Denmark. And it, it really sort of illustrates this fact that, yeah, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could reconnect our communities, especially our, some of our smaller communities and our rural communities, through active transportation and, and mobility. And it really does, as the secretary had mentioned, it's, it's incredibly important from a whole bunch of different levels. Yes, there's the recreation and the, the wellness and the physical activity side, but there's also the economic development side. There's also the active transportation and, you know, and just the utilitarian nature in what these paths can be. And one of the great joys of my being able to travel around the world to document what communities and societies are doing is I get to ride on these things and go from town to town. And that's so cool. And I want to see North America to be able to develop that and do that a little bit more. And so that's going to require that, you know, even at the highest levels, the state levels and even maybe even the federal level of being able to work between different departments and groups and, you know, really talking about how important it is to create opportunities through these activity assets for active mobility. We're also talking about you know, how do we create and build these things at human scale? How do we actually create facilities that start to interact and articulate with the, the communities that we're in? This is a rail trail in Minnesota, Lanesboro, uh, Minnesota. It's known as one of the, the key trail towns in, in Minnesota, in the state of Minnesota. Anybody visit this particular rail trail? Yeah, in the back? I mean. Literally, this is where the trail is intersecting with one of the streets. And so, yeah, it was one of the things that they had to deal with. And they've really leaned into that. This is part of their identity. When we start talking about what, what does a culture of activity mean for a, a community, this is part of it. Is it part of your identity? They embrace it. And because they embrace it and because they celebrate it, not only can the kids use it for getting to school, the elderly can use it to get to meaningful destinations, but they also have a tremendous economic impact for it because people travel from all around to be able to visit this. I visited this uh, 10 years ago, a decade ago in 2013, right after I uh, launched the, the Active Towns Initiative, when I did a huge, uh, big circular trip, road trip, and this city kept coming up as a recommended active town that I had to visit. 
I'm so glad I did. And when I did, I noticed just what level of vibrancy the community have because they've leaned into and are embracing this. Uh, when we were on the DNH uh, trail with Lynn, she point stopped and we pointed out the articulation of the trail to, via the trailhead and also wayfinding signs, to the nearby community there. We couldn't see it from the trail, but we had the wayfinding sign that says just a couple blocks down this way, you have access to restaurants and businesses, and you know that's what we're, we're talking about here. Embrace and do that. Anybody know about the 10 minute goal that the Land for Public Trust has? Yeah, fantastic. This particular initiative is that every resident should have a park, a pathway, a trail, a green space within a 10 minute walk from their residence. Yeah, let that sink in. Every resident should have access to a park, a public space, a green space, a trail, a pathway from their residence. I also, uh, I've interviewed them for my podcast and, and I like to add in uh, the, the fact that we also should have easy access via bike too. So like a five minute bike ride, just like I, I identified earlier, of being able to get to the pool, to get to the trailhead uh, so that I can do, to access my greenway that's local there. So I also like to add in. Don't forget about people on bikes too. Uh, and the reason why that's important, by the way, is it's not about cycling. It's not about being athletic and sport cycling. For many people, riding a bike is their mobility. They, have a, they don't have the ability to walk longer distances, but they can get on an adaptive cycle or they can get on an electric assist bike. And so a bike itself is not a toy and it's not a sport equipment, it's a mobility tool. So that's a good thing to point out. So the work that you all are doing is incredibly important. You are working to create safe, inviting, and inspiring environments out there. And I mentioned earlier that I wanted to make sure that I, I leaned into and talked a little bit more about habit formation. And what happens when we get out on a daily basis and do something like physical activity and we get out there, and again, it doesn't have to be exercise, it can just be movement, getting out there, getting to meaningful destinations. When we do this on a daily basis, a multiple time during the week basis, if it's a pleasurable activity, if it's a pleasurable experience, things happen in the brain, really good things. <laughs> we start to actually uh, generate pathways because we have that release of certain endorphins, we have that release of chemicals within the brain that give us that, that feedback loop. Part of the reason why we, we brush our teeth every day is because while we know we need to do it, it's a little bit of a pain, but we know we need to do it and there's a, a, that, that feedback loop that gets in there. Same with walking every day, same with being able to have access, and again, this is one of your local photos here, having access to these high quality facilities helps to create healthy behaviors. When you have an entire society, when you have an entire community that creates that type of healthy behaviors, that's what we're talking about when I say creating a culture of activity. It starts to permeate through all aspects of life. And I have to, you know, again, applaud you. I've been to the state of Pennsylvania several times before, but it didn't really sink in for me until this trip just how much potential you are sitting on in terms of activating greenways and trails and pathways. So you all are just amazing in what you're doing. I know it's not easy. <laughs> I know it's difficult. Uh, and I, all I have to say is I applaud you and keep up the good work. It's amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm a YouTuber now. 
<laughs> no, I haven't yet gotten into TikTok. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I do invite you to join the conversation. So I do have a worldwide audience of people joining in every Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, for my podcast. I release a new podcast episode. Uh, this week, I'm interviewing somebody from the Netherlands. Last week, I was interviewing somebody from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So please, uh, it would be wonderful to, to interact with you and have that opportunity. You can also find me out on the other social media feeds. Uh, I'm pretty much everywhere, as I mentioned, except for TikTok. Maybe, maybe someday. But I really would uh, encourage you, reach out. If there's anything I can do to help support your efforts, uh, if I can't do anything personally, I assure you I have a very deep Rolodex of professionals from around the globe that can help you with the, the issues that you're doing. But from what I'm seeing, you guys are rocking it. Keep up the good work. And uh, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you so very much. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And a special thank you uh, heading out to Carol Grayshaw and the entire We Conserve Pennsylvania team that put together this wonderful summit for trails and greenways in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you all so much. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.